Good afternoon. I'm Russell Wooldridge, Director of Business Development for DRI International, and I'd like to welcome you to the latest in our ongoing series of webinars. With these presentations, our goal is to advance the knowledge and understanding of our certifications and training programs. Today's webinar, the DRI Professional Practices for Business Continuity, Specific Answers to Penetrating Questions, will fill you in on some of the finer points and practical applications of the DRI Professional Practices. And before we dive into our presentation, I'd like to say a few words of thanks to our webinar sponsor, Recovery Planner. We are very grateful for your generous sponsorship as it enables us to bring this webinar to our audience today. Thank you, Recovery Planner. And with that, I'd like to introduce to you Monica Goldstein, Recovery Planner's Executive Vice President. Monica is responsible for managing and overseeing Recovery Planner's operations and management. In 1999, she was the co-founder of Recovery Planner and in her current role, Monica must ensure that Recovery Planner continues to meet contractual obligations, performs as expected and usually above, and implement measures to meet industry expectations and standards. Monica? Thank you, Russell. Thank you for joining us for today's panel, focusing on some complex planning issues. We are proud to be sponsoring this session today. Because now more than ever, what we do is so important to keeping our organizations resilient and giving the people who keep our companies in business, from our customers to our vendors to our personnel, the knowledge of how to react when faced with an incident. We are charged with keeping our personnel safe and our companies functioning when faced with some sort of incident. For a couple of decades now, DRI International has been on the forefront of providing us business continuity professionals with the guidance and tools we need to do just this. Having an organization like DRII to provide standards like the professional practices is so important to our industry so that we can assist our organizations with providing the best in governance, enterprise resiliency, and preparedness. Since 1999, Recovery Planner has been providing a web-based business continuity management software system named RPX and consulting services to address all stages of business continuity, disaster recovery, and crisis management. Recovery Planner's philosophy is to provide the best BPM software and services by creating more value for less, using technology to continuously improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the BCM lifecycle. RPX is a mature web-based software that integrates all aspects of the BCM lifecycle while promoting collaboration, automation, communication, and integration throughout the planning and response processes. RPX is currently utilized by private and public sector organizations throughout the world, with hundreds of thousands of users across all verticals. Our clients range from SMBs to national and global organizations that include Fortune 500 and SMB companies to government departments and agencies. RPX customers also benefit from our world-class, caring, and dedicated product support team, who are experts in RPX, web applications, and planning, since many of them are also certified DRI planners. To learn more about the RPX software or our BCM consulting services, please visit our website, recoveryplanner.com, where you can also sign up for, an, for online demos of RPX. Recovery Planner will also be exhibiting at the DRI 2013 conference in Philly, June 4 through 7. We hope to see you there. With that said, let's get to the panel. Back to you, Russell. And thank you, Monica. And now on to the main event. During today's session, we'll be hearing from a number of subject matter experts who have decades of experience in the field of business continuity planning. Our speakers include Joy Schraka, Director of Business Continuity and Records for NYSource Incorporated, Thomas Wagner, Head of Business Continuity Management for Direct Edge, and Mike Janko, Manager of Business Continuity for the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Additionally, we have DRI President Al Berman, Director of Communications for DRI Buffy Rojas, and Carl Evans with us to make contributions to today's program. I'm sure you already have many questions in your minds for our speakers, and we welcome all of them. Please use the question box at the bottom of your control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Simply type in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will endeavor to answer as many of them as possible during the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. Before we get to our speakers, DRI International President Al Berman 
would like to provide some background for today's discussion by sharing a bit more about what DRI professional practices mean in a larger context of our industry and the world as a whole. Al? Thank you, Russell. DRI International is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. Uh, we have certified members in over 100 countries. We do training in over 50 countries, and we're truly the international certification and education body for business continuity. We certify people in seven languages. We teach in nine languages. But more importantly, DRI has been involved with government and non-government organizations setting the standard for business continuity during its entire 25-year history. From dealing with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce for Homeland Security Task Force to being a member of the Council of Experts for ANSI ANAB and setting the standard for PS Prep. In fact, we actually chaired the committee that set the framework for PS Prep. We've worked with FEMA, we've worked with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and we've had meetings at the White House. On the non-government side, we collaborate with most of the organizations around the world that are involved in risk management and have been very active internationally. But one of the things that we pride ourselves on is our involvement in standards and setting the bar for business continuity now and into the future. We chaired the Sloan Committee. We are a member of the NFPA 1600 Technical Committee. We were a member of the BS 2599 ASIS Technical Committee. We have worked with FINRA the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, and we're the only non-government standard listed on their site. We have worked with the Asian Pacific Economic Cooperation, and we are the only BCDR standard that is recognized by them. We've worked with the Singapore Business Federation. We are a signatory to the Japanese Joint Aid Agreement. We've worked on standards around the world, including United Arab Emirates, Mexico. We sat on the original IS. 022301 committee and have worked with most of the standards that have been used. Um, DRI is probably the most recognized standard, and we will continue to work with organizations to move business continuity forward. Um, our standards are being used by major governments around the world, government agencies, and industries ranging from financial services to manufacturing to utilities, to transportation. We pride ourselves on being standard neutral and so that we can work with all of the standards, including the risk management standards in ISO 31000, including the new ISO 22301 and 22313. We have worked with SS540 in Singapore. DRI is able to do this because of its board of directors and its staff, which is truly international. Um, we have members on committees ranging from Japan and China to Europe and into Latin America. But importantly, DRI is recognized by the American National Standards Institute as a standards development organization, which means that we comply with the highest standard for the development in the world. So what I hope for is in the future is that we can help live up to DRI's mission statement, which is to try to make the world truly more resilient. And we feel that the way to do that is inclusion, to be able to reach out to other organizations. And we will continue to do that for the next 25 years. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, Al. And now let's hear from our panel of experts. First up is Joyce Schraka. She received her BS degree in information systems from Purdue University. She's a CBCP and has spent over 20 years in the IT field with experiences ranging from applications development to IT management. Joyce worked for BP Amico, Farlow & Associates, Inland Steel, and now Nysource, a Fortune 500 utility company. At Inland Steel, Joyce served multiple positions in management, including information technology and tactical operations planning, which included the development of Inland Steel's three-year strategic operating plan for the production of over 4 million tons of billable product per year. Since joining the NYSource management team in 1997, Joyce held several positions within information technology, including project manager responsible for the applications portion of an outsourcing contract and the office of CIO team leader responsible for creation of policies and processes regarding budgets, 
project tracking, project management, and disaster recovery. In 2004, Joyce transferred to the NYSource Business Continuity Department as the manager of Business Continuity and Technical Services. She served the NYSource Business Continuity Program and is leading the implementation and continuous improvement of that program. In 2008, she led the first company-wide business impact analysis for the nine NYSource companies located in over 13 states in the United States. Recently, the responsibility for records management has been added to Joyce's responsibilities. Joyce is also a member of the U.S. Technical Advisory Group 223, which represents the U.S. opinions towards issues, documents, and proposals before the ISO Technical Committee 223, the committee responsible for setting international societal security standards. So Joyce, please share with us your thoughts on the benefits of following the DRI professional practices. Thank you, Russell. Some of the benefits of using DRII's best practices are they are the the earliest and some of the most mature BCM guidelines. One of the first, if not the first, professional practices developed for the business continuity management. Because of DRII's early adoption of professional practices, there are many companies worldwide utilizing these tried and true practices. Because of the longevity of DRII's practices, it's easier to speak the same language with other companies and vendors when discussing your company's business continuity program. It's especially beneficial when searching for BCM software to ask a vendor, how does your software handle BIA preparation process and results? DRII also periodically updates the professional practices. For example, adding the use of social media under the awareness and training practice. DRII's best practices not only help you develop and implement a business continuity management program, but also maintain your program. The professional practices are not meant for just one-time use, but for the ongoing maintenance and improvement of your BCM program. It's beneficial to review the professional practices periodically to implement ad additional components that your company may not have been ready to implement when you first started your BCM program. When looking at the risk and evaluation and control pr best practice, you need to look at what risks are inherent in your company's documented procedures. First and foremost, are your procedures documented? If the procedures are in someone's head, not documented, or documented but not updated recently, that poses a risk to your company. When you're ready to develop your RTO timeframes, the first thing you need to do is just think about your company. Think about different functions within your company and develop some draft RTO timeframes. Do you think you should start with less than one hour? and then four hours, and then eight hours, leading up to two weeks or greater than two weeks. Selecting those time frames is totally dependent on your company's business. For example, if your company is under strict regulatory requirements, you may not be able to start your RTO time frames at four hours. You may need to start at 30 minutes or even 15 minutes. Specific departments within your company may need almost immediate RTO timeframes for the safety of the public or the safety of your customers or the safety of your employees. You should research the regulations that currently affect your company to determine how those regulations will affect your RTO timeframes. Next, you should review your draft RTO timeframes with several business functions within your company. Pick business functions that you perceive to be bookends to your timeframes, those that you perceive that should have a short RTO and those with a long RTO. For example, customer service may have a very short RTO while the auditing department may have a longer RTO. Talk to several business functions before setting your RTO timeframes. And don't be concerned if during your BIA, 
you need to adjust your RTO timeframes based on actual feedback from your company's business functions. Many companies struggle with the RTO and what does that really mean? Is it one hour from when the disaster occurred? Or is it one hour from when you declare a disaster? And that answer is going to be different for each company. But it should be determined by that company before you embark upon gathering your RTO data. In the best practices under DRII, there's a section under emergency preparedness and response, and it talks about sheltering and sheltering in place. And many companies wonder, what is the difference between that? So there's sheltering, sheltering in place, and also lockdown. Sheltering normally refers to sheltering from a nat natural disaster, such as a tornado or a hurricane. Basically, you need to be protected from natural elements for a short period of time. The key here is a short period of time. Shelter in place adds to sheltering in that the shelter itself needs to protect you for longer periods of time and possibly from airborne hazards, which requires the filtering or blocking of outside airborne hazards. Lockdown can include sheltering, but with the added need to lock the shelter to prevent unauthorized access by hostile forces. Smaller companies can designate a shelter that can be used as a lockdown by, of course, adding the ability to lock the entrance of the shelter. They can also turn the shelter into a shelter in place by using duct tape and plastic, a very cost-effective way to seal air ducts, windows, and doors. Sometimes everyday items used within a company, such as chairs, couches, water bottles stored in the company refrigerator, water bottles from the water cooler, radios from an employee's desk, can be moved into the shelter in place. You should make a list of items normally used within the office that can be used to sustain those, sustain those seeking shelter for longer periods of time. When you start to develop your company's business continuity plan, one of the things you need to think about is, are you going to organize this enterprise-wide, site-by-site, -site, or by business line? How you do this depends on how your organization or your company normally functions. Does your company function as a whole, or do they function as autonomous sites? Answering that question will let you know how to develop your plan and whether it should be organized as a whole or by site. Under the Business Continuity Plan Development and Implementation, there is a su suggestion that you include business continuity policies. You should have an overarching business continuity policy that sets the tone for your business continuity management program. That policy should state the purpose of your business continuity program, the breadth of the program, the frequency of plan updates, who is responsible for plan updates, plan reviews, training, and conducting exercises. Also, what type of plans are going to be required under your program, such as emergency response plans or communication plans. Under the best practice of awareness and training, they mention the use of social media tools. Many organizations are now understanding the value of social media tools, but they also know that those tools need to be controlled, especially by employees or messages sent out by the company. One of the good uses that a communications department can find with social media is it's very valuable for watching what is going on in the public, for hearing what is happening. Those messages from the public can provide very valuable insight for your company's communications department and allows them to craft messages based on what they're hearing 
from public social media. When you're doing a risk assessment and a business impact analysis, you need to think about how often do we want to repeat this process? How do we want to maintain our business impact analysis information or our risk assessment information? The frequency of updating a risk assessment or a business impact analysis is dependent upon the personality and the demeanor of each company. Some companies are rapidly changing, such as technology companies, which would require a greater frequency of updates. Companies that are more stable, slower changing, with minimal regulations, could tolerate a longer time frame between updates. There also could be a hybrid frequency in that not all business functions within the company would need to be updated on the same frequency. Business functions that continually evolve due to increased regulatory requirements or increased technology changes could require more frequent updates as opposed to business functions that are more stagnant. For example, field operations could require more frequent updates due to regulatory changes, as opposed to human resources, which may require less changes, therefore less frequency of updating their business impact analysis. Thank you for taking the time to listen. And now back to you, Russell. Thanks, Joyce. Our next speaker is Thomas Wagner. Tom is the head of business continuity management at Direct Edge, one of the leading stock exchange operators in the United States and globally. Tom is responsible for the development and management of Direct Edge's BCM program to ensure resilient operations. He also serves on the advisory board for BC management. Prior to Direct Edge, Tom held senior business continuity and risk management positions with Gartner Inc., HSBC, Marsh Risk Consulting, the New York Stock Exchange, and Booz Allen Hamilton. While at Booz Allen, Tom consulted the President's Commission for Critical Infrastructure Protection, the White House Critical Infrastructure Assurance Office, Homeland Security, and the intelligence communities to develop strategies to protect the financial services industry from both physical and cyber terrorist attack. Tom, with expertise like that, we can't wait to hear what you have to tell us. So uh, thanks, Russell, for the great introduction, and uh, thanks to everyone on the line for uh, joining us today. So one of the topics we'd like to discuss today, and this comes up uh, quite often, is what, what's the best way to go about working with the business to establish your RTOs or recovery time objectives? And so just based on my experience, one of the things that I've found is uh, one of the most effective ways to establish uh, RTOs is to really engage the business in helping them develop a set of strategic alternatives and so that they can truly understand the risk versus cost trade-offs of different, uh, different solutions. And really the best way to do this is to work uh, first with your CFO organization because you really need to understand and establish the true cost of downtime. And this really involves digging into uh, the financial statements for the particular business unit you're working with to really understand how revenue is derived and which products and services are the key drivers of the business. And this will you know, help you uh, set your priorities around uh, what the recovery time objectives ought to be. Um, but more importantly, it will really help you to begin to understand what's most important to the organization. And then understanding this, the next best step, I think, is to bring together all the key constituents of the particular business unit you're working with and run a scenario-driven tabletop uh, based on scenarios that uh, you think would impact delivery of those products and services. And um, you know, certainly would include in all these sessions all areas of the business, including you know, finance, production, manufacturing, logistics, supply chain management. Um, sometimes we even include uh, critical third parties in the discussion. Um, legal and compliance should be there, and IT, obviously, to understand all the application and infrastructure uh, dependencies. 
Um, since we are, of course, uh, following the DRII professional practices, at this point, you've probably already conducted uh, a risk assessment, which will really help you come up with some realistic risk-based scenarios that help drive the tabletop and really make it realistic to the business. And it could be, you know, the loss of a key product that drives most of the revenue. It could be loss of a, uh, a critical business process, um, an application, IT infrastructure, or maybe a critical facility like a distribution center. And then, you know, out of these, uh, you know, I like to call them brainstorming sessions rather than tabletops. Um, you really begin to understand how long the business can survive without a critical application or key business process and what it will really take to bring the product or service back into production. And as well, in my experience, um, what you get out of this is really a lot of creative and very pragmatic ideas um, will flow from the business around what the company uh, can do to mitigate the risk. Um, and then from there, you can easily transition into uh, professional practice four in DRI, uh, which is to help uh, the business so working along with them to develop a set of strategic and tactical RTO alternatives uh, to present back to the business so they can really decide how long they can afford to be down, how quickly they would like to recover, uh, what it would cost. Uh, to, to do that, and the pros and cons and all the costs versus benefits of uh, each approach. And, you know, I found, too, that the upside of approaching the problem this way, kind of, you know, top-down and very strategic as a business continuity practitioner, is that you really will understand the business very deeply, financially and operationally, and really become, you know, a key strategic re resource for the organization. So another question that comes up around RTOs is when does the RTO really start? Is it within one hour after disaster is officially declared or one hour after the incident? Or when does, when does the clock start ticking and when is everybody on the hook to uh, get the business back up and operational? And this is a really important concept for everyone to understand because when you have the tabletop or brainstorming uh, with the business when you're discussing alternatives and, you know, what's the right RTO, it's important for them to understand that when a major crisis occurs, it may take several hours, maybe even a whole day for the crisis management team to convene, come together, um, really understand the situation and the impact to the business and start making some decisions about, you know, whether to, you know, should we ride out the storm or should we begin activating business continuity or disaster recovery plans? And so all this really needs to be factored into the discussions with the business around recovery time objectives. And, you know, the business really needs to understand that RTO begins. So here's the answer. When the crisis management team makes a call on, on what to do. So from the point that they activate the business continuity or disaster recovery plan, in my mind, that's when the clock starts, and we need to make it very clear to the business that's when the clock starts. And so uh, when we're discussing RTOs with the business, they really need to add in an extra, you know, say half a day delay uh, at a minimum into how long it would actually take to get the business or product or service back up and running. So another issue that comes up uh, quite often regarding business continuity plan development is how should you organize your plans? Should they be done at an enterprise-wide level, by site, by business line? And how do you go about determining which methodology is, is best for your organization? So I can tell you I've been a, a BCM practitioner for over 15 years now, and in the course of that time I've worked worked for or consulted to more than 100 organizations in uh, over 25 countries around the world. And really, you know, have found the best way to organize plans is, you know, first by site and then by business line within, within each site. 
And, you know, I understand, especially for large global organizations, this is, this is a huge task. Um, and, and so, obviously, you know, you really, to, to get going, need to understand each site's risk profile and the importance of the business units at that site to help you prioritize your, your efforts. And one of the things I found successful is to, you know, find a business unit uh, to work with um, to create, you know, that that first that first plan, and a plan uh, a, a complete plan that you can use as a template that you can, you know, uh, distribute around the world, so that uh, other uh, business units that need to develop plans have uh, something good to to work with, but. The importance of priorities too is is, is twofold. So, uh, just to give an example, I had one client I worked with, and they had uh, two sites with identical BIA results in terms of financial consequence of loss and other factors. And when we began to look at risk, we discovered that you know one site was near an earthquake fault line. So obviously, we focused our priorities and, and plan development efforts there first. But um, so now this brings up another point, and there's been a long-running debate in the profession around, you know, should we have separate plans at each facility to cover different scenarios? So should there be a separate plan at each site for fire and another one for flood and earthquake, et cetera? And really the short answer to this is, you know, the scenario you plan for is usually not the one you get. And so I found it's much easier just to assume in your uh, planning, and uh, uh, this is uh, prescribed in the DRI practices, that it's much easier just to set out uh, a time horizon over which you think you'll be out. And so, uh, and one of the ways to do this is, you know, if you assume that a business is only going to be down for a few days, that might not be enough of an impact to the business to put proper plans in place. They may sit back and say, well, we'll just ride this out. And so I found, you know, the best strategy is to assume with the business that, you know, the facility or product or service um, will be out for a, a couple of weeks, you know, two weeks at a minimum. And that will really help the business focus on uh, you know, building the right sort of customized recovery strategy, strategy for uh, each business unit and, and the affected location. So the GRI I practices suggest that a business continuity plan should also include business continuity policy statements. And the question we get quite often is, so why, why is this important? Um, what policy statements should be included and, and why? So let's just take a step back a little bit and talk about what a business continuity policy does and why it's important. Um, you know, policy, what it does, it really helps business unit managers understand what their responsibilities are with respect to business continuity planning. And so, you know, typical policy statements would make it very clear that the business is responsible for following all the best practices we know and love, such as making sure we conduct at least annually a risk assessment, a business impact analysis, and either a tabletop or live exercise for each business area uh, based on the business area's uh, crit criticality. So, um, and, and all the other, you know, great things that we do uh, during a year uh, to, you know, flesh out the business continuity life cycle. But um, the importance of this, obviously, is that it, it really ensures that business continuity uh, is really a business responsibility and that each business unit allocates an appropriate level of capital and resources to make sure that these things get done. So thanks, everyone, for listening in today. And at this point, I'd like to pass the baton back over to uh, Russell. And thanks once again. Bye. Thank you, Tom. Very informative. Our final panelist is well known to DRI audiences. Mike Janko is responsible for strategic and tactical 
business continuity related activities for Goodyear's global operations, which include 52 plants in 22 countries with approximately 69,000 associates and an annual sales of some $21 million US. Mike has over 25 years of experience in all aspects of business continuity planning, including incident management, crisis communication, business impact analysis, disaster recovery, and risk management. His certifications include ARM, Associate in Risk Management, CEOE, Certified Engineering Operations Executive, and MBCP, and CBCLA, Certified Business Continuity Lead Auditor. And Mike has a master's degree in mechanical engineering. Goodyear's global business continuity process has been recognized both internally and externally as a real competitive advantage. Global teams have effectively responded to and recovered from over 750 human, natural, and technologically based incidents since the team's inception. He has been an instructor at two universities specializing in business continuity related courses. He is also a member of the Contingency Planners of Ohio, the CI Editorial Review Board, and the NFPA 1600 Technical Committee. Welcome back, Mike. What do you have to share with us today? Thanks, Russell, and all attending for the opportunity to provide you with our feedback. The first question, what are the benefits of following DRII best practices? By following a process such as the DRI 10 professional practices consistently, an organization can stay focused on key components of an effective business continuity program and adapt to new and emerging regulations, requirements, and standards. We believe they help set the tone for an effective organizational business continuity process. We've taken this to the next step in conducting internal benchmarking of the 10 professional practices for the past six years under a continuous improvement process called business continuity excellence. We establish metrics and tra track to improvement goals. Second point, can an organization get certified under DRII? Would a planner and an organization follow the same BCM guidelines, different ones, or a combination? Multiple standards and guidelines for certification are being developed. We made the decision over 10 years ago to follow NFPA 1600 DRI's 10 professional practices and continue to see the benefits of doing so. By following guidelines, standards, or best practices consistently in the organization, all parties involved begin to understand their roles, whether it's being responsible, accountable, consulted, or informed. What is the basic methodology of the DRI best practices? We get the entire organization engaged in the business continuity process. This includes all the key components and best practices. We continue to make process improvement. We are tying together all pieces of the puzzle, which include risk assessments, the critical processes, incident planning, software and tools, awareness, training, exercises, crisis communications, and partnering with external agencies. We recommend working with your critical partners, customers, and suppliers to have a common focus on incidents and risks, the critical processes, and then in the planning, response, and recovery as required. For BIAs, how do you suggest a company establish the RTOs? We recommend determining who the key players in your organization are, Get their feedback via surveys after you educate them on how accurate recovery time objectives can help you to prioritize recovery goals. Continue to cascade the results to everyone, all parties, so there's clarity as to what true priorities are when the major, major incidents do occur. Keep refining the process post-incident via gap analysis and improvement using tools like SurveyMonkey to do so. You want to ensure the whole process is integrated and aligned with business priorities. When a company says one hour as their first RTO, what does that really mean? Is it within one hour after a disaster is officially declared or one hour after the incident occurs? Well, we base our RTOs after the major incident has occurred. Others may do it differently. For non-IT related major incidents, there may be no declaration of disaster. So it is better to start the clock once the major incident has begun. 
The two could be simultaneous, though. Under business continuity plan development and integration, it suggests that one of the first steps to take is to decide how the plan should be organized, enterprise-wide, by site, by business line, etc. How would an organization determine which methodology is best for them? You need to tie it back to your business operations. Are you structured by product line, geographical location, or some other mode? See if you can follow that model. Ultimately, there needs to be feedback to leadership so you know how to break it up. Continue to show business value and meet the needs of the customers are our business continuity goals. You want a single evergreen and sustainable model to follow. Under business continuity plan development and implementation, it suggests that a plan should include business continuity policies. Do you have suggestions or examples of what these may be? Our business continuity policy and organizational charter are based on compliance with NFPA 1600 and DRI's 10 professional practices. I truly believe where others fail is to have a consistent focus and message on how they will implement their business continuity process throughout the organization. Whenever a new concept comes along, many may drop what they're doing and start chasing the next popular concept. The two most important items in doing so is having leadership support and funding. Funding includes not only tools like software, hardware, and equipment, but time, full-time equivalents and part-time equivalents to be dedicated to making the whole process succeed. Under awareness and training programs, it mentions utilizing social media tools. Do you find that organizations are now including the use of social media in their plans as part of emergency preparedness and response planning? If so, how are they utilizing it? How do you control the use of social media by personnel? While social media is one of the most difficult things to try to control, all you can do is try your best, develop policies, educate your team members, and focus on hoping for the best. This is the human element unknown in many programs. There are privacy and safe harbor requirements that come into play with social media programs as well. There are crisis communication sayings like 30 years of hard work can go down the drain in 30 seconds when wrong messages are delivered at the worst possible time. One way to get everyone on board may be to use social media for inbound messaging, fully knowing that what you see may need to be vetted a little bit more. Once you have that established, then focus on outbound messaging. You will be taking steps in the right direction to be at a competitive advantage. Under maintenance, is there a best practice or suggestion as to how often the risk assessment and business impact analysis should be done? One recommendation is to conduct it minimum annually or more frequently if needed when proven to be in need of updates. Surveys can take a long time to implement. In a large company where many people play many roles, surveys are constantly being sent, and some may not take them seriously if they receive them too frequently. Risks are ever-changing, so you, mean, you may need to change preparedness, response, and recovery strategies even before conducting another assessment. Examples of recent high-profile risks that many may not have focused on in the past include cyber, supply chain, radiological, and weapons of mass destruction. If you see them evolving, you may need to react quickly. Also, if you have an organizational change like a merger or acquisition, What's critical to the company may likely have changed, so you may need to conduct another survey. Thanks again for the opportunity to present our responses to the survey, and back to you, Russell. Thank you, Mike. Great job as always. And thank you to all of our speakers. Before we get to our Q&A, I'd like to turn it over to Buffy Rojas for just a minute so that she can tell you a little bit about the DRI 2013 conference that's upcoming in Philadelphia. Buffy is our Director of Communication and has been writing about our industry for almost 20 years. Buffy? Thank you, Russell. And a big thank you to Recovery Planner for sponsoring today's webinar and also for sponsoring DRI 2013, our second annual conference, which will be held June 4th through 7th at the Pennsylvania Convention Center in Philadelphia. I'm really excited about DRI 2013, and I hope to see many of you there. In my 20 years in this industry, I've been to all of the major conferences. I've even helped plan a lot of them. And I can tell you that DRI's event is special. 
As a nonprofit organization, we're able to approach our conference from a truly unique perspective. And as a global organization, we've made a concerted effort to make this a truly international event. We've got speakers and attendees from all over the world, as well as really fantastic educational sessions and networking opportunities. I encourage you to check out our conference program at driconference.org. There are quite a few discount codes available for registering, and I'm sure you'll qualify for one of them. Just call our customer care center at 866-542-3744, and they'll help get you registered for the event. See you in Philadelphia. Thanks, and back to you, Russell. And like you, Buffy, I'm excited about this year's conference. Can't wait to get to Philadelphia. And now to the Q&A. The DRI International Commission is responsible for maintaining and updating the professional practices that have been the topic of today's conversation. For the Q&A, we have a member of that commission, Carl Evans, to join us to answer some of your questions. Carl is Vice President of Business Continuity for the Santa Barbara Bank and Trust, a bank holding company based out of Santa Barbara, California. His responsibilities include business continuity, disaster response and contingency planning, emergency management, risk and business impact analysis, and auditing and testing of plans. In addition to a BSEE and an MSEE from the Georgia Institute of Technology, he holds several professional credentials, including CBCP, of course, a Level 5 Homeland Security Certification, MBCI, and he is DOD Certified Anti-Terrorist Officer Level 2. Carl's professional career includes information system security in the aerospace industry, disaster recovery planning in the telecommunications industry, and enterprise level business continuity planning for the cable TV and banking industries. Carl is a certified instructor for Community Emergency Response Teams, or CERTs, and actively supports the CERT Planning Committee in Santa Barbara County, California. Additionally, he is currently a member of the InfraGuard Los Angeles Chapter and SoCal First, a financial industry emergency planning group in Southern California. Carl has led business continuity and emergency response teams covering all aspects of disaster recovery in both local and regional events. I know you're no stranger to it, Carl, so thanks for being on the hot seat today. Thank you, Russell. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I think we can. Um, All right. As is often the case, we've got a bunch of questions that um, are in the same theme, and of course we have a couple that are quite specific. So we'll get into those with a couple. Of, the first one is a process question uh, that would come out of your experience with the commission. What's the methodology or the process that's used when we update something a standard like the DRI 10 professional practices? Well, the commission meets formally on a, on the monthly basis and we do email interchanges on a continuing basis. But during our monthly meetings, we identify any changes in the industry. Uh, since we're all active in the industry as well as on the commission. And we also look at any uh, feedback we, we have from our certified professionals regarding what they see in the professional practices in their particular business when they're asking for clarifications, for example. And then on an annual basis, we formally do a review of the entire professional practices and the uh, continuing education activity points uh, schedule and do a, an evaluation of whether or not there needs to be a major release uh, for that particular document. And typically every two to three years, there are enough changes accumulated that there is a formal release and then uh, minor releases are simply made as we go along. So when you go onto the website and open up the professional practices, look at the latest revision date at the bottom of the document. Our current revision for the professional practices is dated June 1st of last year. And so, that is, and that's on, they can get that through the website by, by a PDF, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, the other question there, on each of our panelists mentioned it, and of course, uh, what I'd like to elaborate a little on it because we've got a number of questions about it. Where in the professional practice can someone find guidance on the use of social media? That seems to be the hot topic and the one question everybody wanted an answer to. Well, specific guidance is going to depend upon the particular company and, and your management organization. 
but in in the professional practices we address social media uh, in the BIA section because you have to identify that as a potential reputational risk as one of the presenters spoke. We also have to incorporate the impact of crisis uh, of things like Facebook and Twitter, Twitter and what our policies are going to be and procedures are going to be during an actual event. Uh, what I would recommend on, on that sort of thing and what I've seen in the industry is you go through your public relations office, you don't want every uh, manager or the, uh, the employees in general acting as official communicators for the company. So typically what folks have done is set up a, their, a company Facebook page, a company Twitter feed, so that during a time of crisis, employees and the public have a place they already know exists that they can go to to get information on that is publicly disseminated by the company and also to pick up trends from news in the field. And then, so that, that's in section uh, professional practice nine under crisis communications. The reputational risks identified in, in professional practice three under the BIA discussion. And then once you've got your, your risk identified and you've got your plan, crisis communication plan identified, you need to make sure your people are trained on it, and that's addressed in professional practice number seven. Okay, so practices three, seven, and nine all specifically address social media. Another question that we've gotten from another people, a number of people, is about the subject of RTO. Um, the best one was presented uh, in this form. Can I get additional information about RTO and when it begins if you have an application outage that turns to a disaster? Okay, again, that is going to, in some respects, be industry specific. For example, if you are something like a large retailer where you're taking online orders, you know, Amazon or Office Depot or something like that, and your main systems go down, you're literally losing dollars every second that you're down. So in that kind of business environment, your RTO has to start at the time of the event, the outage. If you have a less customer impacting, less revenue impacting outage, so let's say your email goes out, you do and you bring your emergency response team together. You assess the situation. If the and you have a predetermined threshold that you've established in your emergency response plans, your incident management planning, that says if the outage is going to last longer than this threshold, then we're going to make it a disaster declaration and and activate the appropriate plans. If it's less than that, then we'll go through our standard maintenance and repair processes. And that's where I would do the distinguishing in the RTO. Okay. And before we get to our last question um, for you, Carl, I've got one that I can answer myself. Um, I've been, we've been asked if you're going to publish the highlights of today's discussion or recap it in some way. This webinar will be in recording on our website. So just check out our website later this week under the news section, and you'll be able to find a link directly to this webinar. Um, Carl, the last question we have for you regards large application or large organizations and different business with different business functions, with different priorities within a function and the group level, how do you approach an organizational wide BIA under the professional practices? Like eating an elephant one bite at a time. <laughs> <laughs> The, the way to approach a BIA in a larger organization is you, you indeed do that one bite at a time. You go down to the individual uh, operating unit, department, uh, this, ever how your organization is set up, uh, go down to the smallest business unit, work with those folks uh, through your standard BIA process to assess what they do, how they do it, what they need to do it, what the risks are that could that could knock them out of an operational status, and you get their personal or profession, their particular professional assessment of what their RTO should be. Now, a lot of folks tend to have uh, an attitude, yeah, my department is really important. So you, let's say you have 40 different business units that you're doing the BIA on, you may have 35 of them say, yep, 
I've got to be up and running immediately or within four hours or whatever your critical uh, mission critical type of time frame is defined as. But once you've gathered all that data, you have to level it. And it's what I would call RTO leveling. So you take the individual business units and their risk assessments, their, their impact uh, analysis, and their suggested RTO. And then you present that up at the, a higher management level that looks across the board of the business. So that a business can say, yeah, email is important, but it's not really mission critical. Therefore, that particular function is can be given a category two instead of a category one. So I guess the easiest way to do it is to say you, you, you can't just do it on a standalone basis for a even a large department that has multiple sub uh, groups in it. You have to still level it out at the business level, at the enterprise level. Uh, was that answer clear? Russell? I believe it was. I believe it was, Carl. Okay, well, that's the way I typically that I've typically approached it in my career uh, in a really small company where you've got a half a dozen departments. That executive buy-in and, and the RTO leveling is almost instantaneous with the development of the BIA. But in the much larger, especially geographically dispersed organizations, you really have to gather all the data and then feed it and present it uh, with recommendations to the executive management team. Well, that's all the time we have for questions today. Thanks, Carl, for your very informative answers. And I'd like to thank all the panelists for a very lively discussion. And of course, thanks to Recovery Planner for sponsoring our event today. I hope all of you learned something new. If you have more questions or you need further information or you'd like to reach one of our panelists, um, if you wanna go over something that wasn't covered, or you're looking to schedule a training for your team or your department, please give us a call at 866-542-3744. Or send an email to info at DRII.org. Include the title of this webinar when you send that question. A recording of this and all our webinars is posted on our website, www.drii.org. I'm Russell Wooldridge. And this webinar has been a production of DRI International, 2013, all rights reserved. Thank you for your attention.